It's the 1980s. Millions of viewers are tuning into Top of the Pops each week. And indeed, Pop was back with all its fantasy, image and glamour. Anarchy has been crushed and the major record labels are back in town with video as their weapon of choice. Creating stars overnight, there's money to be made by the chosen few. This is a story of creativity, power and intrigue set within the hallowed halls of 80s pop. Sade and Paul Anthony Cook, Just a Drummer, part three. When a band has worked together for years and they suddenly hit the big time, some members of that band get left behind, sometimes for good reason and sometimes it's a little more interesting. I'm Douglas Pye, and this is the story of Paul Anthony Cook, who got treated as just a drummer. In this series, I'm talking to Paul, who is the former drummer with the band Sade, and a friend whom I'd lost contact with for nearly 35 years. And here we catch up with Paul, who is now out of the band, and he finally works out what has happened, and court cases loom. Finally, I was demoted to actually nothing <laughs> after that last perform TV performance. So at least it clarified where I was. I was neither a session drummer or the original drummer. I was actually gone at that point. <laughs> so basically, that was you out of the band. I got one last call from Stuart, who wanted me to attend a party with the band for some reason. And I thought, well, fine. Um, I thought it was just like a, a goodbye party for me, you know, let's let's have a party for one last, uh, you know, time with Paul. Um, so Stuart picked me up in, in a cab. He could afford taxis then, which was great. I was very impressed. And But he just kind of um, briefed me in the cab, which was a bit weird. He, he, he said, uh, well, he said, Paul, I think um, it'd be better if you um, just tell everybody that you've you've left the band you're on a cord and you know obviously it's going to look better for you if if you don't say you've been sacked is that all right and I said well yeah no problem I mean if that's what you want me to put across so we entered this club club night and obviously everyone was coming up to me and going oh Paul you, you you're leaving the band you know leaving the band Shard you know what, what's going on and you know I had to explain that oh yeah I've, I've, I've left the band <laughs> and um Stuart was saying to me, uh, I think, uh, have you, are you playing with Banana Rama? Because funnily enough, uh, there was a Paul Cook, uh, a drummer called Paul Cook, playing on one of the Banana Rama singles. <laughs> so he was just hoping, I think, that, you know, I was, and that I'd migrated from, you know, Sade to Banana Rama. You know, at the end of the day, I suppose they were all thinking, it, it, you know, it would show everybody, uh, you know, me leaving in a different light. Um, you know, mingling with the the same set of people we used to, and yeah, and you know, I was I, I was effectively publicly managed out of the band as as just a drummer that had left the band. Simple as. So after this, you no longer played for Sade, and I believe Sade, along with Stuart, signed another deal with Epic, and of course, Paul Denman was still in the band with some sort of agreement what were your feelings towards the band at this time and as you saw the singles coming out and the, and the enormous album sales yeah well i mean i think we were all surprised i mean you know we knew things were good but we didn't you, you never think things are going to be so successful so yeah i mean you know it was it was incredible the the success Sade got in 1984 but to me i was just it was a bit of a, a release for me, you know. I I concentrated on my band Esposito, and I was trying to get a deal. I was writing music, I was producing demos, uh, dealing with record companies. I had a manager at the time, um, and and you know I thought, well, really, it's nothing to do with me. You know, it's it, I've moved on. And then come nineteen eighty seven, Lee Barrett gets the sack as Sade's manager. 
and you found out from his office that there were triple platinum discs awarded to you by the BPI in 1985 for your work on Diamond Life. And could they deliver them to you? Was that a surprise? Yeah, it came out of the blue. I mean, I was, it was very odd. I was living in a uh, flat in St. John's Wood. I got the call. Uh, I knew nothing about the discs again uh, until that moment. Um, it was really bizarre. And if you were a session drummer, would you receive this? No, not not at all. Um, I must have been registered as a member of the band to get the discs, as um, as when I played on top of the pops, I was registered as being signed to the record company CBS as well. I mean, I wrote to the BPI eventually, and they wrote back to me and confirmed that I would only get the discs uh, as a fully fledged member of the Shardair band. Did this not raise any red flags for you about your position in the band? Um, no, it was just a, a part of what was a very weird episode with Chardin registrations. Um, they they couldn't quite make up the mind, you know, what I actually was in the end. <laughs> so, um, but it was impressive to put on the wall. Um, and I, and I, being a poor musician, you know, trying to get a record deal, I thought they were playing them, so I thought I could sell them. Um, but when I did take them out of the case, they were vinyl sprayed with, you know, some metal paint. So I was very disappointed. I couldn't get any money from them. And I'm now back in King's Cross for the next part of our story. And looking back over the last 40 years, um, this is one place where much of it really has changed beyond recognition. It was once really sort of run down relic of the Victorian era. It like, had a lot of character, but it was a bit of a shady character. But this area has now got, uh, it's, it's just undergone a vast development and uh, it's got swanky high rise flats and offices, uh, along with bars, restaurants, and high end shops. And the likes of Google, Facebook and YouTube have offices here and of course it's here that Sony Music have their HQ. Now talking of which, in 1993 Paul started court proceedings. So let's find out how this came about and why. Yeah, so I was, I was advised by a friend to send a letter to the singer with, with a claim to rights and uh, well to my rights on on the Shardy stuff and you know asked and I asked him for a payment for my work in eighty three. And were you oblivious to the fact that you maybe owed money from your contributions to the album? Yeah, I didn't know I had any rights, um, you know, for my contribution at that time. At that point, had you spoken to or, or been in contact with any of the band members since the nineteen eighties? Yeah, I was still friends with uh, Paul Demon, uh, and we were always in touch. You know, we were good friends. Uh, we we'd meet whenever we could uh, within his schedule. Um, I, I remember going to Paris. Uh, he'd organised uh, me to go over. I think he'd gone back to the UK. They were in Paris recording uh, the second album, Promise, and uh, he said I could use his flat. And uh, I took my girlfriend over, uh, and he said he was going to leave me five hundred quid. Yeah, in the flat. Um, but, you know, we got there and we couldn't get in. He hadn't, he hadn't arranged the keys, so he'd screwed up in that respect. So uh, I ended up going up to Saint Denis, uh, the studio, recording studio in Saint Denis uh, in the North Paris to, I think it was the North, to pick up um, some keys to try and get into this flat. Um, yeah, and I met all of the guys. I met. Uh, Shardé was in the in the uh, control room. She was excited to see me. Did a little dance, and Stuart wasn't as excited to see me. He uh, knocked over my beer bottle. I remember he wasn't very happy. Uh, but Andrew Hill was fine. I mean, he, he was throwing money at me left, right, and centre. You know, um, telling me to have a good time. You know, here's a load of here's a load of cash. Have a good time while you're here, Paul. It was. Yeah, it was great to see him and, 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 and great to be to be in the studio with him at that time. And then I was invited by Sade to uh, a, 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 what was a really flash apartment in, I think, with the Isle Saint Louis, I think. It was this little enclave in, in Paris. Yeah, we met and uh, I remember her master, um, 
clicked my neck, which was nice. And we had this uh, interesting photograph with her on this chair and me and Andrew at the feet of the chair as though she was the, some kind of queen. Um, so, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. And she mentioned the fact that she couldn't go out in public anymore and she had to wear a wig and in a disguise when she was driving around paris so you know and she was a, a well-established star then um yeah but it was great to see it um good fun yeah and then uh in 92 i got married uh invited all the band paul came down dressed as a teddy boy which was interesting again um and with his mother, he brought his mother along and we were at, uh, I think, Tipton Hall for my wedding. Um, but no, none of the rest of the band acknowledged my wedding and never sent cards. Or, and I thought it was a bit odd. Um, so, yeah, I was I was slightly offended at that point. I, I thought they would have made more effort collectively. Um, and then it was that time when I, after I was married that a friend said, well, I just might have a claim against Sharda for what I did. Um, so he actually wrote the letter, um, which I then posted to Sharda about getting compensated for my work on Diamond Live. And then it just all kicked off legally. In what sense? What happened next? Well, I, I didn't get anything back from Sharda herself. Um, you know, I, I well, saying that, I think I got a very... Kurt letter which said something like you should know me better Paul if if you was a, a you know a writer or a, a Jew writer in that respect I would have compensated you you know you know me better than that I think I got a very brief note on it but the main rebuke came from Brian Carr Compton Carr solicitors uh, it was a very kind of snotty letter from from him and, and he said I didn't have any claim um, whatsoever and he's, it was very derogatory his terms in the letter which annoyed me which only really pissed me off actually at the time so then I met a, a solicitor Riaz Burma and he championed my cause in in 95 he was a bit of a crusader ex-barrister um, but he was also into music um, but I felt I'd been um, pushed into court proceedings by by them all, really. It wasn't a route I wanted to go down. And uh, after that, I, I got an angry message from Paul Dem on, on my answer phone saying that it, we could no longer be friends um, if I was going to go down this legal route with Shardy. So court proceedings started in 1995 and ran through to 1997. Tell me what happened and, and what was the outcome? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I was supported by, as, as I said, Riaz Burma and his firm. They championed my cause. And uh, if it wasn't for him, nothing would have proceeded. So, um, you know, and he obtained legal aid for that uh, case, which carried on right until the end. Uh, so I've got to thank him greatly for that opportunity because not many people get that opportunity to take you know such a major artist and record company to court um but at the end of the day you know in in the defense uh from Shardy and Cerny but especially Shardy they were just saying um that I was more or less sacked for incompetence and that I had no claim um you know and Shardy herself intimated that in a witness statement suggesting that my you know drumming at the Vienna U for sure wasn't any good and that it was an embarrassment to her and the band at the time. And has anyone verified that this was not the case, that all your drumming was up to par? Yeah, I mean, at the time we hired uh, two music industry experts. Uh, one of them was Elton John's drummer, Charlie Morgan. Um, and and he, in his report, he suggested that I was clearly an integral part of the band uh, and a band drummer, uh, as opposed to a session drummer from what he'd heard me play on all the, the tracks and tapes we had. But, you know, I had no time to contest it. I couldn't go into court with the um, U4 video recording, which I, which I, which I had to prove that I was, uh, you know, cock on in, 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 the sh in that shirt. Um, and my legal aid certificate got pulled um, and I couldn't afford to actually go to court to, to bring my case. Um, 
I had a QC who was, who was being paid a thousand an hour, and it certainly wasn't possible for me to pay for that. Uh, you know, so I missed the opportunity of being able to show that you know on video I was spot on at that time at that gig in Vienna, and and therefore prove that you know I was a good drummer. Um, and after this, uh, after my legal aid was pulled, I, I got offered twenty uh, k to stop talking about the claim with this was put into court at the time uh, i didn't accept it um uh, because it, it was on the terms that i couldn't write anything about the band in the future which i didn't agree with and at that point my bill to the taxpayer was fifteen thousand pound but if there wasn't a claim why get offered twenty thousand pounds I think it had been a cheap way to shut me up. I think they were hoping that you know I would accept that in in full and final settlement, and they would get a disclaimer so I could never go back to them in the future and and sue them. You know, I think that was the plan. Uh, I just think it was very badly badly arranged, um, but I never accepted it. And and when my legal aid certificate was withdrawn, the money just went back to the band. Um, you know. There was caveats attached to the offer, which, um, you know, I rescinded on the basis that I wanted to write about the band and I wanted to talk openly about my experiences with the band in the future. Yeah, so, I mean, it was a difficult offer um, not to accept. £20,000 at the time was a, a lot of money to me. I mean, I was unemployed with my family, um, you know, an unemployed musician at the time still. Um so, yeah, it was a very difficult offer to turn down. And while we're here, let's do a quick summary of another case that was going on. Paul was also trying to collect his US performance royalties, which he contested through Phonographic Performance Limited, or PPL. It's a, a British music copyright collective. This investigation took place between 2000 and 2003 and triggered court actions between 2007 and 2009. However, the claim against PPL was dropped by Paul as he says he found it impossible to fight them or indeed direct them to collect his US royalties when he says there was a clear policy to only distribute that income to those signed to a major label. And this case against Shardy was also struck out by a Hull judge in 2009 as Paul did not have a solicitor and couldn't argue his case in court. Hope you followed that. And then you started proceedings again in 2009 with the BBC um, as you still hadn't received payment for your uh, Top of the Pops performance in 1984. Tell me how this came about and, and, and what happened. Yeah, so I sued the BBC of uh, non-Top of the Pops performance monies and uh, owed to me from 84. I mean, I looked into the, to the contract with the BBC and I should have got some some residual payments. Um, subsequently, I won this case. And to add in here, this was more of an admin error and not the BBC's fault as they presumed that these payments had been made by the record company and they agreed to an out-of-court settlement. The BBC are lovely people whom I like very, very much. And in the case discovery stage, when I took them to court, uh, the BBC sent me the singer's recording contract, which I was I was very surprised at receiving, um, but they sent me a copy anyway. And reading through it, um, I started to question the grant of rights clause in that contract uh, in relation to the to the master tapes and the fact that she had said, well, she had a hundred percent ownership of those master tapes, and it was a it was a subsequent twelve year conversation of me talking on social media about Shardé and the Masters that um, uh, revealed um, Jack Stevens uh, through a, a chance meeting on, I think it was on LinkedIn between uh, uh, somebody who said, you need to speak to this guy. And, and I, I said, who, who is it? He said, well, it's Jack Stevens. He's the guy who signed Shardé. And I, and I remembered Jack, I remember the A&R guy, but I didn't know his name was Jack Stevens. Um, so he came forward and we started talking um, and we had a lot of uh, email threads and LinkedIn threads and he was revealing a lot of information that, you know, I just wasn't a party to. 
uh, due to my status in the band as just a drummer at the time. Um, and then, you know, after he clarified situations around secret deals and, you know, money's being transferred and the meetings with Robin Miller and all concerned, that we, which were behind my back, uh, and I was very surprised that, I then approached my uh, current solicitors um, and they advised me, yes, I did have a claim uh, under the master rights um, situation and performance copyright situation and that uh, they would they would write to Sony and all concerned and try and move this forward. And, you know, it, it all brought into context the the situation with with the invoice which i, I now presumed was uh, a fake invoice and it was something that they were getting they were getting me to sign um from my point of view as a session drummer at the time which i never was i was unemployed i never was a session drummer in london at all and to get me to sign it to satisfy that master rights claim by what was the singer's company um so basically i mean in a nutshell if i hadn't sued the bbc in 2009 i would be none the wiser i wouldn't have seen the singer's contract and i wouldn't have really realized my current claim to the Sade master rights situation so where are you up to in the proceedings yeah, well, currently I need to raise uh, 25k um, for my solicitors to proceed to court. Um, otherwise, there will be no court date. I mean, I've spent a year, uh, you know, on 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 being supported by friends and family, on uh, you know dealing with Shardy and Sony on a without prejudice basis. Um, but you know, to get this into court, I'm going to need at least a minimum of 25k. So, I mean, luckily nowadays we've got crowdfunding. So everything's changed. You know, we don't get legal aid anymore. If we need to be supported, we have to go online and get thousands of people to contribute £35 to the, to the cause. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. I've got a, a page on crowd justice. Um, we've raised around about 1,200 so far. And we've got a stretch target of 25. But that, that page is going to be there for a long time until we, you know, we receive that those pledges from people and then we can take you know shard it to court so i think i've set a little bit of a precedent here when when you think about it in that i'm most probably the first person in the world to try and take a, a major superstar to court via crowdfunding so that would be an interesting one if we do get into court because it won't be public money anymore it will be um you know um people on the internet supporting my legal case so after all this do you still play the drums it, good question actually um i have tried <laughs> and i find the whole process rather industrial now um a, a singer in chicago did uh, hire me um actually as a session drum <laughs> after all these years <laughs> Well, she paid me to work on her a single and um, we, we kind of worked remote. Obviously, she was in Chicago, but I remember getting to the studio and um, it was like being a tradesman, getting my kits out, setting it up. I said to the guy in the studio, I was at Fairview, I used Fairview Music, which is a local studio. And he, I said, this is my God, it's so industrial, you know, uh, setting this kit up and, 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 and getting just getting started as a drummer. Um, and I think, you know, looking back, the whole commitment of drummers is, is extraordinary. And it um, it just reminds me of the story of when Shade, when we played in Philadelphia with um, the band. And this guy very recently contacted me on YouTube after he'd seen my uh, stuff on YouTube. And he said, um, he said, I was a train driver and I missed the gig. Um, but I, I got there and I was talking to the band at the bar. And you was um, breaking your kit down on stage still. <laughs> and uh, so that really sums it up. Um, so the answer is now, if if someone wants to pay me, really pay me, then I'll play the drums. Uh, but I have to have a drum tech on hand because uh, after all, I'm now 60. So, yeah, I mean, in some respects, uh, I've become a session drummer. <laughs> 
And finally, what does your wife and kids think of the whole case? Uh, are they like, oh, no, not Shardy again? It, it's an interesting experience being in, in, a, in a band like Shardy that is successful and also being connected to successful music because it never leaves you. And, um, you know, people... People have still said to me, well, I still I still remember you from back in the day when you was on top of the pops. And, you know, that that always lives with you. Um, but my kids are very proud. Uh, and every time we hear someone operated together, we all have a big laugh about it. Um, and if anybody's abroad uh, in a bar or a hotel, they always send me a video on WhatsApp. Um, for some reason, they find it quite amusing that they sat there listening to me playing drums on Smooth Operator. So I'll get I'll get relatives and videos from people all over the world, um, you know, coming through to me, which is quite amusing. Um, and I've just got a little story about uh, when I was in um, Argos with my daughter Jasmine when she was younger, and we just sort of rocked up to the to the stand to pick up the, the toy and Smooth Operator started playing. She goes... Daddy, that's your song. And I said, yeah, darling, that's my song. <laughs> so since then, she's always perceived that as my song. And then she actually went down to London to Ronnie Scott's um, to see where it all started with Pride and Shardy and was very impressed at, you know, Soho and uh, that that area and the club itself. Um, and, I, you know, I think generally they've taken my creativity and strength uh, with them in, in their career. Uh, into what they do so overall I think it's been a very positive influence on them um, which in turn has helped them be successful and so in conclusion the story goes on for Paul as he continues to push his court action to show he was more than just a drummer and hopefully we'll be able to update you with a part four. And as for me, I've finally heard Paul's story and the answer to the question I felt I couldn't ask half a lifetime ago in the Lord Stanley. And meeting up with a friend after 35 years has got me thinking about all the changes that have happened in my life and indeed about all the changes that have happened in all our lives over the last few decades. How we all aim to be more than just a drummer. And with all the new and varied methods of communicating, I still think the best one is just talking. Fancy a pint in Lord Stanley? If you're paying, dog. Yeah, I'll send you the invoice. <laughs> just a Drummer was written, edited, produced and presented by me, Douglas Pye. Music by Paul Cook, with Paul playing premier drums as used on Diamond Life and sound mix by Guilt Free Studios. This was a Cook Pie production.